Sunday morning. Welcome to church. It's good to see you this morning. There are some announcements to, to take care of. Our hog roast and silent auction, Sunday, September 11th. There's sign-up sheets over in the West Wing. You can sign up to bring food. You can sign up to help. Um, we need all the help we can get. Poinsettia order forms are in your bulletin this morning as well. They're coming in pretty good. Uh, blessing of the backpacks this morning. I'm so excited for that. Newsletter articles are due on Wednesday the 24th if you are um, in charge of reporting for your committee. Closed closet is um, our responsibility yet. So um, Thursday, this Tuesday and Thursday of each week. And there's a sign-up sheet in the West Wing for that as well. The deacons will meet on September 6th. It says September 4th on the bulletin, but it's September 6th. Are there other announcements this morning? Upper rooms, so. Upper rooms are available over here too uh, this morning, so if you get one of those, uh, please remember to pick that up. Anything else? The Robertsons have sweet corn this morning. They will be out on the east side of the church by the elevator entrance, so don't forget that <laughs> if you haven't had sweet corn yet this season or haven't gotten enough of it, they will be outside on the east side. All right, let's prepare our hearts and minds for church.
Please join me in the opening prayer. Lord of all creation, we pause before you today, letting our heavenly eyes on the altar before you. Summer's warm and the rest are almost gone, and our minds are turning to the time ahead. Students and educators are thinking about school. Partners are thinking about crops and fall harvest. Business people are thinking about profit margins. Politicians are thinking about elections. Retailers are thinking about the holidays. As we bow our heads before you, help us to put aside today's worries and tomorrow's fears, that we may worship and learn how to live with our presence today. Amen. So are you ready to go back to school? Yeah! Oh, okay. <laughs> Here's an excited one and not so excited. Are you excited? Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Are you, are you excited for school? Yeah, yeah. Awesome. What's more, what's the best part of going back to school? God, as we gather here this morning, we gather at the start of another school year, and we lift up these students, we lift up their parents to bless them as they embark on this new year, that you might open their minds to learning, and that you might remind them as they go throughout the school year that this faith community is with them as well, and thinking about them hoping they're doing well. We ask you to bless the teachers, the administrators, and all those involved in the school, life of the school, the cooks, the janitors, all those people, that you might bless them as well. And gracious God, we bless, ask you to bless these backpacks, the 
the packs that will transport those books and projects and, and things like that to and from school. We pray in your most holy name that you will bless all of it. In Jesus Christ, amen. Now, you didn't what? You didn't pray. What were you doing? Well, God will still bless you. Right? Here's some... Um, this is to put on your backpack. It says, you've got this. And then it said, let all that you do be done in love. And the name of the church is on there. So you remember that the people of the church are thinking about you too as you go to school. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Thank you for coming up. God bless you all. Someone tells a story of waiting and waiting their turn in the emergency department of the local hospital. And a young mother comes running in with her little child. And the little girl was crying as the mother was holding a bloody handkerchief over her mouth. And she's looking frantically for someone to help her. And she rushes to the desk and, and says, my daughter's been hurt and I need to see and she was immediately interrupted, cut off in mid-sentence. You need to take a seat and wait for one of the clerks to sign you in. But my little girl was hit in the mouth by a... And she was interrupted again. Please take a seat, ma'am. Someone will be with you shortly. And about that time, an ER doctor came walking through that lobby. And he saw the woman. And he said, this little girl needs help now. The emotions for the woman and the little girl to come with him and leads them to an exam room. The person who's remembering this story was guiltily sitting there wondering, well, if they took them in, when does my turn happen? But then that person remembered this. If I live to be 100 years old, I wonder if I will ever see another time when a person's pain so clearly wins out over the system's protocol. The doctor was seeing the child in pain, and the clerk at the desk was looking at the hospital's rules and procedures. And that's what I see at work in this scripture reading today. Jesus sees the need. He brings healing and freedom and announces the good news. 
On the other hand, the religious, religious authorities are locked in on process, procedure, rituals, and requirements. For so many years, this is how they ordered their daily lives. The people were to obey the rules and fulfill the requirements of those who taught the rules. The rules were so complicated, it oftentimes took experts in the law to determine whether you should walk 300 steps or even pick up an extra piece of firewood without breaking the Sabbath law. But here comes Jesus, and he sees a need. And the only thing missing in the story from Luke is, is, is the synagogue clerk who might ask the poor woman, as she comes to Jesus, do you have insurance? Aren't we sometimes like the religious authorities? Don't we sometimes get bent out of shape when rules and procedures are not always followed? A lot of people have gotten good at looking the other way. To not see the other. And then we say, oh, I didn't see you standing there. And a lot of us know the flip side of that, too. Sometimes we want to just disappear. To not be seen. Because we're ashamed of what we think others will see if they really look into our eyes. So looking at the ground becomes a way of life. It becomes a safe place to navigate life. And I think at some level we know that if we return a glance, something that requires our presence is going to happen. And when our eyes lock, we'll be asked to make ourselves visible. And we don't always want to be called out. And that's being vulnerable. And it is risky. To put ourselves out there is risky. To be visible to the other is risky. And to also let the other in, into our life. We don't know much about the woman in the story from Luke. Except that she was there when Jesus was teaching in the synagogue. She'd been bent over by a spirit for 18 years. She was forced to look at the ground as she went through life. She would have been one of the people you would be easy to pass by. Maybe even easier to stare at. We could look at the curvature of her spine without the risk of her catching her eye. Even feeling good about ourselves and because we feel sorry for that poor old woman. You know, even worse than that is being unseen. Being unseen, yet being observed or watched and analyzed. It's probably not a stretch to imagine that the crowd that day who was there watched this woman make her way through the crowd. Jesus saw her too. But he didn't just watch. He didn't continue with his teaching. He stopped. He really saw her. And in the glance of Jesus, which must have been the kind of look that goes directly to the heart, Jesus raised her up by laying his hands on her. And she straightens up. And you can almost imagine their eyes meeting, their eyes walking. And how she must have been amazed that she was being seen. Seen apart from her evil spirit, no longer that old bent over woman, but now the friend of Jesus, eye to eye, person to person, partners in the life of God. And she sees too, she sees God right in front of her. My guess is that this moment of healing for the woman was a moment of healing for Jesus too when his teaching was finally raised up, when his teaching was made visible so that those gathered to hear him could see now see the power of God 
the power of God's love and compassion. She was the mean through which God's power was made evident on that day. When Jesus looked into her eyes, she must have praised God too. In the meeting of the two, the reign of God bursts into the world for everyone to see. This was the Sabbath. This was the time for resting in God's good creation. God's eyes. Resting in the look of one another. Delighting in the life that flows through us when we become friends of God. The woman would walk away upright. And Jesus would now go on to Jerusalem. No doubt with a little more courage that God would see him too in his suffering as well. God brought life to a bent over woman. God would not prevent God's eyes from seeing a suffering child. God would indeed raise up the dead to a new life and the world a new future. In the eyes of God, we can see exactly where we are going. I can't believe it, but we're nearing the end of summer. And some families have already finished up vacations. We begin that routine of the school year, the fall. So I hope you've been able to experience the love of family and friends, the love of God, and the beauty of creation this summer. It's really only as we live in God's eyes that we find the power and the courage to really see those around us and to be present in those moments to notice the beauty of God in creation, the beauty of God in each other. And there is no doubt that the world these days cries out to be raised up, to be seen. As I prepared this sermon, I was remembering the Afghan and Ukrainian refugees, the ruthless Taliban watching every move, and recalling the pictures of a war-torn Ukraine as I see pictures of people literally running for their lives, and women bent over caring and protecting their children. Would we stop and really see her? Would we allow our eyes to catch, or her eyes to catch ours in such a way that we would both be changed and raised up? I suppose that's the question that gets posed in our gospel text for today. Having been seen by God, will we now see? Whether it be the world's most profound humanitarian needs, or the woman coming down the aisle at the grocery store. Will we see her or him? I remember a bent over woman who lived in my neighborhood as I was growing up. And she would pull a little cart behind her as she walked downtown to get her groceries or whatever else she might need. We called her Grandma Shop. And it got so after a while we didn't notice her. She was just there. But we didn't, didn't see her anymore. And I know it's hard. It's really hard. Because there's so many things that distract our attention away from God and away from one another. And to really see one another. Yet it is in these faces that come before us that we will find the face of Jesus. In the risks of human relatedness, the love of God is set to wash out over all the world. And this is the mystery of the Word made flesh. That Jesus, now present in the bent over woman, is for us. By looking, we become the ones that are raised from the dead. 
And in that bold movement, to look and to see, we find ourselves truly seeing. And we sense that we are made free. Healing is let loose into the world when we dare to look into one another's eyes. And to be remade in the image of Christ. So may we too be the ones that give thanks. That praise God. That praise God on that last day as we make that long journey through death's night. Hoping that we will find that one thing that can meet our deepest needs and longings. And we will already have been seen and known by a God who will never say, Oh, I didn't see standing there. But rather, you're free. Stand up. Come in. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please rise and sing him. Uh, it's him number. It's long in the bulletin. Hymn number 280 if you're using your hymnal.
Can you give us any kind of progress report on Amy? Amy is home, so that is a good thing. She will be um, healing there, so, yeah. Doris. Uh, Lori Shelton got COVID oh, no. in the midst of her trip through the Andes. Only two days before it was over, but came home, and because of her heart transplant, she was not able to take the regular kind of medication that is given to people, so she had to go for an infusion at Iowa City. But she is recovering now, so thanks to you, Doc. Wow, yes. never changes. And we know this by the way you continually bless our lives with the good things that come from your hands. In thanksgiving, we bring our voices full of praise and add it to those of long ago and those unborn to honor you. We give lift up thanksgiving for birthdays and retirement, time to step back and just relax. Yet there are times when our praise comes easily, the words are easy to speak, hearts are full of joy. That's when everything is going well. There are also those times when we feel we cannot praise you, when illnesses are diagnosed. When our children get into trouble, or we get laid off at work, or we are the only caregivers. And so we pray for all of these who may not be able to pray. Pray for the sick, for those facing and going through um, the sorrow and grief of death, for the brokenness of our lives for strength in the healing, for courage in the caregiving, for our service women and men, for the world's leaders. Bring healing, bring comfort, bring peace, bring hope as we lift up Amy and Tyler, Dawn, Kelsey, Caleb, Gail, Loretta, Eva and Dan, Jeanette, Rosella, Herb and Nick, Don and Phil, Bill and Betty, and Lori. We lift up Harleen, Irene, Lois, and Jean, Shirley, Beth, and Mona. We lift up Ian, Adam, and Abigail, Matt, Rose, Madison, Connor, and Tom. We lift up the well-being of our country and our world. We continue to pray for the refugees around the world. We lift these to you, gracious God, for your caring, for your healing and your keeping. Help us, gracious God, to know that in all things, whether we live or whether we die, you alone are worthy of praise. And we stand now and forever under your mercy. Mercy, who is your only Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, the one who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
as we come, may we show our, our thanks and praise God by giving back. I would invite the ushers to receive this morning's offering. <laughs>
knowing that as we go, God goes with us. God's love surrounds us and works from within us. Let's go with courage. That's what God's people say. Thanks be to God. Amen.